the microbes and the modern world, from the globe to the gut. This is the first of a series of three talks. So I'd like to take a moment for introduction um, and start by thanking some of our sponsors. Um, we were sponsored to put this on by the College of Arts and Sciences here at the University of Oregon, as well as the Associated Students of the University of Oregon, um, the Department of Biology, the Institute of Molecular Biology, and the Institute of Ecology and Evolution all have sponsored us, as well as the Oregon Humanities Center Endowment for Public Outreach in the Art Sciences and Humanities. Um, so all of these people have helped to, to bring this to you, um, as well as Greaves, the Graduate Evolutionary Biology and Ecology students. That's us, us. We put this together for you as budding academics. We believe that it is of the utmost importance to bring science from academia out into the public, public world. So the graduate students here in Ecology and Evolution have sacrificed their free time, their spare time, to be able to put this together. Um, so let's, let's, let's thank all of these wonderful people. So microbes in the modern world. So what, what are microbes? What, what do they do? Where do they live? How do they interact with us? And, and why does it matter? That's, that's what we're trying to answer with, with these talks. Um, probably everybody, when you, when you think of a microbe, you have, you have an image in your mind, right? Uh, probably for most people, it's something that looks a little bit like a pill. But it's kind of an abstraction, because they're too small to see. And when we think of those little abstract pills, probably for most of us, that's tied to the idea of disease. Micro, you think microbes, we think germs. And germs, you know, kind of, they kind of make us sick. But maybe, you know, the idea of probiotics has been, has been kind of coming into the public a little bit more. This idea that in yogurt and things along those lines, there are microbes that can do good things for us, that can prevent the microbes that make us sick. Um, so we, but when we think about microbes, we think about, we think about us. We think about our health, our bodies. Um, and that's not a bad way to think about it. This is, this is definitely right. You've probably heard this before, but I'll say it again. Um, you, each one of you, has 10 times as many microbial cells in your body as you do human cells. You're made of microbes. And it's not just you. It's other animals. It's plants. It's the world, right? Microbes are the dominant life forms on, on Earth, right? So that's, that's what this is about, this, this series of talks is to explore some of the, the insights and understanding that new technologies and new tools are providing about this dominant form of life here on Earth. And luckily for us, here at the University of Oregon, we have some of the top minds in the field. So in addition to presenting cutting edge research, we're, cutting edge re we're presenting cutting edge research that's being done right here. So this series of talks will be three talks. Today, Dr. Brendan Bohannon will be, will be giving a talk, a scientist in Whoville, new perspectives on the invisible world of microbes. And he'll be, be covering sort of broad insights and broad scales. And then on May 8th, mark your calendars, Dr. Jessica Green will be talking about the ecology of indoor environments, this, the biology of the built environment, the ecology of, of, of your homes and your hospitals, right? And on the 29th of May, the final talk, Dr. Karen Gilliman will be presenting the molecular dialogues with the microbes inside us. How do, we, how do we communicate and, and what do the microbes in our guts do for us and how, do they, how does that work? Right, so that's a series of talks. So today, we have Dr. Brendan Bohannon giving us a wonderful talk, a scientist in Whoville, new perspectives on the invisible world of microbes. Now let me, I could say Brendan deserves, uh, Brendan um, doesn't need an introduction, but it's kind of my job to introduce him, so I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, Brendan is brilliant. Um, he got his bachelor's from Humboldt State in California before moving east, <laughs> before moving east to do his PhD at um, Michigan State University, um, where he worked with Richard Lenski studying um, evolution using uh, experimental evolutionary microcosms of microbes. And then he did a, a postdoc at um, University of Chicago, and then spent nine years on the faculty at Stanford University before deciding that Oregon is a much better place to be, and coming to join us here at University of Oregon in 2006. And he's the director of the Institute of Ecology and Evolution, a 2009 Aldo Leopold Leadership Fellow, and a member of the first class of Google Science Communication Scholars. Um, 
His research focuses on the causes and consequences of microbial biodiversity. I won't say anything else about his research because I'm sure he can tell you himself. Everybody, I give you Brendan Bohannon. Thank you very much. That's, that's a sort of introduction I wish I had recorded for my mother. That was lovely. Thank you. I'm a little, uh, a little bit difficult to follow Rue Vandegrift to give a talk, but I'll do my best. And good evening. It's a real pleasure to be here. I want to thank the graduate students in ecology and evolutionary biology for the opportunity to talk tonight. It's a great honor to, be, to lead off this series of talks. As Rue mentioned, I'm a microbiologist. I study uh, bacteria, viruses, and other really tiny microscopic forms of life. What I'd like to do tonight is to share with you a new perspectives on this tiny world. They're starting to emerge from the science of microbiology. And I've been a microbiologist now for about 20 years. And when I think about how my science has changed over the last 20 years, what I really think about is one of my favorite stories from childhood. It's the Dr. Seuss story, Horton, Here's a Who. Anyone recognize that story? I brought a copy just in case to spark your memory. Remember this book? One of my favorites. So if you recall this story, the story opens up with, with, uh, with Horton, this very calm, gentle, big elephant, you know, just hanging out in this jungle pool, cooling off, his big ears flapping in the breeze, when he hears this little noise. Okay? He hears this, at first, he doesn't believe that he hears it. But then he hears it again, starts to look around, and he realizes that the sound is coming from a speck of dust on this little flower. And he listens more carefully, and he realizes there's this entire little world of Whoville on this speck of dust. And all of these, eventually all these members of Whoville, these Whos are screaming, we are here, we are here, getting his attention. Right? So most of the book, let me get my remote. There's the speck of dust, where he's hearing the members of Whoville. Here's Whoville. And for most of the book, he spends under, trying to understand this invisible world, he starts to value it, this invisible world. And then by the end of the book, he's, he's protecting this world from those who would do it harm, like the uh, McWhorter brothers and uh, just, uh, kangaroos that are trying to destroy this little world. So as microbiologists, many of us, we're, we're sort of in the same place that Horton is in the story. We have just begun to really hear this little tiny world, you know, our Whoville, this world of, of microorganisms. And as we've gotten to know this world better, our perspective on this world has really changed. We're starting to see just how fascinating and diverse these little tiny forms of life are and how vulnerable they are to human activities. And that's the perspective I want to share with you tonight. But to do that, I kind of have to start with, with what our old view of Whoville was before I can really explain what this new view is. And right? this old view, Rue alluded to it when he gave his introduction. When most of you think about bacteria or viruses or microbes, even those of you who are my students, I'm sure you still, the first thing that comes to mind is what? Okay. Is disease, right? pestilence, plagues, epidemics, right? This is the, it, since the, the, we first discovered a relationship between some microbes and disease, this has been the narrative that's really been, that has de determined how we interact with the microbial world. This view that microbes are these scary things. This is a picture from the 1800s, uh, su uh, suggesting what the year 2000 might look like in the future. Here we are still fighting these nasty creatures. We have these new tools to be able to attack them. And this is, this, all this is an, although this is an old perspective, it's not a historic one. I mean, people still think of the microbial world this way. It's in the, the cover of magazines, the war against microbes, you know, revenge of the microbes. These are scary things, right? These, these little organisms out to get us. Right? But this, this, is, this is the way we used to think about microbes. But now, in this new perspective, Microbes are starting to look more like this, all right? <laughs> Perhaps more our allies than our enemies, and much more interesting than we had previously thought. So what I want to do tonight, I want to give you a little introduction for the first part of my talk to, to why this perspective on microbes has changed, some of the reasons why, our, our uh, the new understanding we have of the tree of life, a new appreciation we have for the sort of contributions microbes make to how the planet works and these new tools that we now have to study this tiny world. And in the second half of my talk, I'll give you some examples of things we've learned with this new perspective and with these new tools. 
about uh, how diverse microbes are, how vulnerable they are, how widespread microbes are in the, in the environments around us. And in the end, I'll give a little bit more of an introduction to the two talks that Rue mentioned. They're going to follow mine in this series. All right. And hopefully we'll have some fun along the way. All right, so start with this sort of, uh, our, our changing attitudes as scientists toward thinking about the microbial world. And one of the things that, for me, I think has really driven my, my, this new perspective on microbes for me has been a new understanding of the tree of life, of the, the diversity of life around us. So since uh, uh, really bef before recorded history, humans have looked around them and categorized the sorts of forms of life that they see around them. Here's an early example of that. This is Aristotle's great chain of being where he envisioned this hierarchy, starting with uh, sort of inanimate matter, going through plants and then animals and then humans and the metaphysical realm above that. This is how he made sense of the, the world around him. And then uh, if we fast forward a, a, a great number of years of human history, we end up with the first kind of depiction of life using a tree. This is Ernst, or one of the first anyway. This is a tree of life by Ernst Haeckel. Right? And now we've moved from the strict hierarchy, uh, where there were uh, plants, animals, and humans at the nearly the top, to three major branches of life. Right? The plants, the animals, and the prot protists, as he called them in the middle here. And we're a major branch of this big branch of life in the animals. Now, when I was in school, in, in elementary school and high school, we learned this view of the world, Whitaker's Five Kingdoms, right? another way to kind of think about the tree of life. But one major branch in the plants, the animals, the fungi, all supported on this foundation of the, the simple microorganisms, the protists, the very bottom, the most primitive kind of basal organisms, the monera, the bacteria, at the very bottom. Again, this sort of idea of a hierarchy. That, and we're among those that are most developed at the very top of this, this tree of life. But work recently has really shown that the tree of life looks more like this. Right? So this big bush here, is primarily made of microorganisms. If you look across this entire tree of life. There's three major branches in the tree of, the way we think of the tree of life now. This branch here, the bacteria, that we're all familiar with. Second branch, the archaea, which looks sort of like bacteria, but are as different from bacteria as they are from other forms of life. And then this third branch, the eukarya, which consists almost entirely of microorganisms as well, except for these tips of these branches right here consist of the sorts of life that we think about a lot, like this weird duck-human hybrid that we all seem attached to here in Eugene. Right? If you think of this tree of life as kind of like the math at the Valley River Mall, then you know, we're right there. We're right at the tip of this branch right here. You know, how humbling. All of a sudden, we've gone from being the, you know, right below the metaphysical realm in Aristotle's hierarchy to being the tip of a little minor branch in one of the three major branches of all of life. So my friend Norman Pace has called this transition, he's considered this to be a really big deal, and he's called this transition a change from Ptolemaic biology to Copernican biology, from a, a kind of biology where humans were at the center, like in Ptolemy's world, the Earth that was at the center of the celestial bodies around which everything orbited, to a, a Copernican biology where we're no longer at the center, like Copernicus's vision of the, the, uh, the universe, the, the celestial bodies, orbiting around a, a common sun. So this is one of the reasons why, I think as scientists, we have a different view now on microbes. We realize that, that most of the life around us consists of these little tiny forms of life. So another reason that we're starting to think about microbes differently is that we have a new appreciation for all the good things that they do for our planet. And one of the reasons we have that new appreciation is because of all the bad things we're doing for our planet. So human activities, it's very clear, are resulting in environmental change on a global scale, unprecedented in human history. Right? And a lot of that change is change to, to uh, processes, to ecosystem functions that microbes are really central to. So it's given us a new appreciation of how important microbes are. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that, a couple of examples. So one of the things that microbes are particularly good at is they're kind of nature's master recyclers. They're the garbage haulers you know, of our world. And one of the things they do is convert 
uh, chemicals from one form into another. This is an example of that. And many of you, I'm sure, have seen a diagram, perhaps exactly like this one, if you've taken class recently, of the nitrogen cycle. This is a, this idea that, that nitrogen exists in high concentration in our atmosphere. It's needed for growth of plants and ultimately for animals. But it requires some tricks of chemistry to actually get it into forms that are useful <coughs> for plants and animals. And one of the ways that this happens is that nitrogen is brought into soil from the atmosphere through the action of microbes called nitrogen-fixing bacteria that interact closely with plants. And that nitrogen then becomes a, in a form that plants can use. Um, and it's assimilated by plants. It can also be converted into a, a, another form that plants, many plants prefer even over this form by nitrifying bacteria. The plants and the animals that feed on them then die and their bodies are decomposed and that nitrogen is recycled into this nitrogen cycle. And ultimately, these forms of nitrogen can be lost either through leaching out of the system or they can be lost as in gaseous forms of you know, nitrogenous compounds that are lost into the atmosphere. And this whole process of cycling is absolutely required for life to be sustained on Earth. If the cycle stopped, most of life would, would stop. And every step along the way in this, this cycling of, of nitrogen is catalyzed, is mediated by a different sort of microorganism, okay, each individual step. Right. So uh, one, and this, this particular cycle is interesting because this is one area where humans have had a huge impact on how the, the Earth works. We've altered the rate at which nitrogen cycles around the globe. We've altered the, the way that it's cycled around the globe and the controls on that cycle. So there's new interest in un understanding these players that are involved in, in recycling nitrogen, for example. So that's one reason why. There's just a new appreciation for the good things that microbes do. But it's not just nitrogen. There's another example, and I'll return to these a little bit later in my talk. Of, of, of the good things that microbes do. This is a cartoon of the methane cycle. So methane is a gas that's produced in soils and sediments. Uh, it's a, a powerful greenhouse gas, many times more powerful than CO2. Um, and, it can ha and it can profoundly, has the potential to profoundly change the climate of the planet if methane is released in large quantities into the atmosphere. And methane is ultimately the product of, of microbes in the soil. This is methanogens in this cartoon. They're a member of the archaeal group, the one branch of the tree of life that I showed. They're the, the source of methane, and the major uh, consumers of methane are microbes as well, different forms of methane oxidizing bacteria that can eat, eat methane and remove it from the atmosphere. So understanding how human activities are altering the release of methane and what we can do to increase the consumption of methane requires that we understand little creatures like these methanogens these methanotrophs or methane consumers. So another reason why there's just been more interest in the, 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 uh, um, the idea of microbes as allies, not just enemies. So finally, the third reason why we really have this new perspective on microbes is because we have new tools that are allowing us to see much more clearly and more comprehensively this tiny, invisible world. Right? We have kind of bigger ears on our Horton, right? You can hear Whoville much more clearly than we could before. So to describe to you uh, what I mean by these new tools and why they're so important, I have to describe to you a little bit uh, about how difficult it is to study microbes, how different it is from studying things like plants or animals. So it's not easy to study microbes. And one of the reasons is because, well, they're tiny, right? That imposes all kinds of challenges on a scientist who wants to understand these forms of life. So on the left here, this is a photograph, the tip of a needle, magnified about a million times. And these, each of these is a little, or maybe a little less than that, or a thousand times. Each of these is a little uh, is an individual cell of a bacillus. Right? And so just to give you an idea of just how tiny they really are. So this needle looks like a mountain with these little microbes on it. This is sort of a, a microbiological version of how many angels can fit on the head of a pen. As close as I get as a microbiologist. So if we blow up one of these little pictures, you can see that, that um, if we look at these microbes, there's not a lot to, for us to use to discern one type from another. These look like, well, like Cheetos, right? <laughs> and when you look at microbes, especially the members of the bacteria and the archaea, they look like different snack foods. They don't really have a lot of detail that we can use to, to tell them apart. Some look like little, those little cheese puffs. Some look like Cheetos. Some are kind of curled like 
for those corn doodles or whatever. No. Perhaps I'm a little hungry tonight, but, but I, I see snack foods when I look at microbes. And there's not a lot of detail we can gather from just looking at them. Can't really tell them apart. So that makes it difficult to study. Uh, the traditional way that microbiologists have gathered information about microbes has been to bring them into captivity in microbe zoos, essentially. Here's an example of a microbe zoo. These microbes are growing on these petri dishes. They're, you can see them because they're piling up as they've grown until they form a colony big enough to see with the naked eye. Um, and, and if we can grow them like this, we can ask what they feed on, we can ask what pigments they produce, whether they can move around under their own power, you know, questions like that to really, get, to really get to know them more intimately. But unfortunately, we can only do this for a tiny subset of the microbes that exist in most environments. In most environments, far less than 1% of what we can see under the microscope can we actually culture in the laboratory. So here's an example of what we call the culturability of different environments. So what proportion of the microbes we can see under the microscope we can actually grow. And you can see for, for, for many environments, like soil, for example, much less than 1%. So there's all these microbes that we can't keep in captivity. At least we haven't figured out how to do it yet. And so that really limits our ability to understand uh, microbial world. All right, so luckily, luckily for me, in my career, the, we have tools now that allow us to get around some of these problems. And most of these tools are really different versions of using biomarkers to understand uh, uh, microbes or identify microbes in different environments. And what I mean by a biomarker is it's just a biochemical component of a microbial cell. It's an example of a, your average microbial cell. And we can uh, use lipids from the you know, fatty compounds from the outer membrane of a microbial cell as, as way, ways to identify different microbes. Or we can use nucleic acids, so genes, parts, parts of the genome from microbes from inside a cell as a biomarker to identify uh, different sorts of microbes. And these allow us not only to identify microbes, but in some cases to uh, make some educated guesses about what they're probably doing, so what their functions are in the ecosystem. And some of the work I'm going to talk about uh, my t later in my talk involves using these nucleic acids, so DNA in particular, as a biomarker to allow us to identify microbes that we can't keep in captivity, we can't study in any other way. Okay. And these techniques have really revolutionized the way we think about the microbial world. So we really, really, this is, the, this is the part where I feel the most like Horton. I really feel like I'm seeing, perceiving the microbial world in a really different way because of these, these new tools. And I'll give you some examples. All right, so there's some ideas as to why we now think of microbes as being maybe more allies and enemies, being really diverse, a little more vulnerable to our activities than we once thought. So over the, the next half or so of my talk, I'm going to give you some examples of things we've learned using this new perspective and these new tools. So I'll talk a little bit about this idea that microbial diversity is much greater than we ever thought and much greater than any other form of life on Earth. Um, I'll tell you, so give you some examples and talk about a, bit, a bit about the implications of this new idea that microbes are much more vulnerable to human activities, especially environmental change than we once thought. Again, and I'll give you example one, or if there's time, maybe two examples from my own work uh, in this regard. And then I'm gonna, I'll end by talking a little bit about just how widespread microbes are. And I'll use this as a way to introduce the two talks that are going to follow mine uh, in the series. So let's talk a bit about diversity. And to do that, talk about microbial diversity, we have to talk a little bit about how we know what we do know about the biodiversity on Earth. And to do that, I have to tell a story. This is one of my favorite stories about biodiversity. I've never been able to determine if this is a true story or an apocryphal story, as they say, which is a nice way of saying somebody made it up. But it should be true. I think it's true. It's fun to tell, anyway. So I'm gonna, let me just tell the story, and you'll see. So the way the story goes, there's this very important event in England. And two fellows were attending this event, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the very famous biologist, J.B.S. Haldane. So already, those of you who are ecologists know where I'm going with this story. So they were both in this event, and when dinner started and people were seated, they realized that the hostess, perhaps with evil intent, had put them right next to each other. Right? And so, uh, and the reason this is, was a bit awkward for them is, of course, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the religious leaders of the UK, right, of the, the Anglican Church, 
And J.B.S. Haldane at the time was one of the most famous atheists in England. They put them right next to each other, a little bit awkward. And so, bless his heart, the archbishop tried to break the ice to start a conversation with Haldane. So he asked him, Professor, in all your work, what have you learned about the nature of the creator? And Haldane answered, well, in his sort of gruff, crusty way, well, he must have an inordinate fondness for beetles. <laughs> That's his image of God, a deity who just has a kind of an obsession with beetles. Right? And where this idea comes from is this view that most of the diversity of life really is insects, and most of those insects are beetles. And this is a, this is a pie chart, right, that represents the, the number of described species on Earth. So all the different forms of life that we have described as species that have Latin binomials, like Homo sapiens. Right? And most of that life consists of insects, all the red here, followed by plants and purple, and other groups, there's some fungi in here, and then this tiny little slice, about at this point maybe 9,000 species, represents all the bacteria and all the archaea, and those two big branches of life, on the tr or branches of the tree of life, represented by just these few described species here. Now we know, well, to, to become a described species of bacteria or archaea, you have to be able to keep these organisms in captivity and ask a lot of very detailed questions about their physiology and their biology. And I just said that we can't do that for most of life. Right? So we know that this must be some kind of an underestimate of what, of the true number of species of microbes on Earth, right? of bacteria and archaea in here. And so a number of people have tried to figure out, well, well, how many species are we missing when we try to study them in this traditional way by bringing them into captivity? And one of the first estimates of this was done by my friend uh, Vigdis Torsvik in Norway. And what Vigdis did about 20 years ago was to just sort of do a relatively simple uh, experiment to ask, well, how many different types of microbes exist in, say, a pinch of soil, a, a gram of soil? So what she did was to take a sample of soil to extract all of the bacterial and, and now we know archaeal cells from this sample, to bust those cells open and extract all of their DNA, all the, nu the nucleic acids from inside the cell. And then what she did was to heat up that mix of DNA. Now these are D this is DNA genomes from all the different microbial cells or bacterial and archaeal cells in the soil. So she took that mix of DNA and she heated it up. And though, uh, as most of you know, DNA is, consists of two molecules that are intertwined, right? And they're bonded together based on their, this common sequence on each strand. So as you heat it, what happens? Right? The DNA unravels, right, into single strands. And so she heated it till all the DNA unraveled, and then she let it cool. And she just followed the process of each strand finding its mate and winding itself back up together again. Right? And the more complex that mixture of DNA, the more diverse that community of microbes in soil, the longer it would take for these two strands of DNA to find each other and wrap back together. And so when she did this with the DNA from a gram of soil, what she found was it took amount of time to come back together. It would uh, be true if there was about 10,000 different genomes, sufficiently different to be called different species uh, in that mixture. So 10,000 different species in a gram of soil. So more in a gram of soil than we had all of the described species of bacteria and archaea on Earth right, in one gram. And this seemed, this seemed magical at the time. How could there be this much diversity packed into a single gram of soil? And so uh, other people have you know, gone on to build on her numbers to do kind of back of the envelope calculations. Well, if there's 10,000 species in one gram of soil and there's all these different kinds of soil and there's other environments on Earth, how many species might there be on the entire Earth of bacteria and archaea? And in one estimate Dan, my friend Dan Dykhaus came up with was somewhere between 100 million and a billion different species of bacteria and archaea, of which we have described officially 9,000. So we have a lot of work to do. So you should all become microbial ecologists. So a lot of work to do if this is true. Now, now that's a real, really rough estimate, you know, based on this new technique. You know, but in the end, what it looks like is this may be what the world actually looks like, right? <laughs> so uh, insects, plants, you know, everything else. But the real world looks like this. All bacteria and archaea, and maybe there, there might be maybe 3 million uh, species of insects people have estimated, of, of which we have described maybe 800,000. And then everything else is crammed in there. Right? And so this, this was a, a provocative idea when it was first proposed. But studies since then have really confirmed this idea. 
that there are very few environments on Earth where we have exhaustively sampled all of the microbial life. We, every time we go back, we find new things. So it's suggesting that, that, that these environments on Earth are really, really rich. That they're very, very diverse microbial communities. And this is true also if you look, about, look at the rate at which we're discovering new microbes across the whole planet. So here's an example of that. So what this is is a graph of, of unique uh, ribosomal gene sequences. And ribosomal gene sequences are biomarkers that are really commonly used to identify different types of microbes. So you can sort of think of this y-axis as the number of different types of microbes, or kind of like the number of different species, for plants or animals. And this is time starting 1992 when we first started to look for these genes in any kind of comprehensive way in environmental samples to this fall, September of this fall. And what you can see is the rate of discovery of new types is accelerating, right? It's ex growing exponentially at a time where the discovery of new plant and animal species is really starting to level off. So this also suggests that, that, um, uh, that there's a lot of microbes out there that we have not yet discovered. So working as a microbial ecologist now, or even a microbiologist more generally, it's a really exciting time. It's like we've landed on a new planet, and we're just starting to explore all the diversity of microbes that, that, ex that share this planet with us. And the talks later in the, the series are going to talk more specifically about the, this, these diverse worlds and different environments. So I'll mention that in, in a little more detail in just a moment. But this idea that the world is ve has very diverse microbial residents kind of begs the question, well, what are all these different kinds of microbes doing? And are, the, are, are our activities um, influencing their diversity the way we are influencing plant and animal diversity? You know, are we causing extinctions? Are we moving microbes around? Are we changing their abundances in important ways? And that's the topic I want to just touch on briefly next. Oh, and just so you know, last time I checked, we have about two and a half million different types of microbes measured in this way. For those of you who are keeping score. Get this talk next year, I'll, I'll tell you where we're at. All right. So this idea that, the, in, that our activities, especially the way we're, we're changing the environment of Earth, uh, might alter microbes, it was a controversial idea just 10 years ago. Um, people thought that microbes are so abundant, they evolve so quickly, they're so redundant functionally, so many of them can do the same thing, that the idea that we actually have any kind of effect on their diversity and that, and that we could alter the functions that they perform in any way seemed kind of ridiculous. Right? And the first few studies that tried to ask this question really didn't find any big effect on diversity of the sorts of environmental changes that humans are imposing on the Earth. And so people didn't really pursue this at first. But then there started to be this sort of buildup of examples of where it does seem like we are influencing this tiny world in ways that, that we should probably be concerned about. So I want to give you some examples of that in the next few minutes. And then we can talk more about this afterwards. So I mentioned that there's great evidence that the Earth is changing quite rapidly, actually at a rate faster than any other than we, in human history. And that when we think about these global scale environmental changes, we can really they really fall into one of three big categories. Or one of those is land use change, which means we're altering the way we use the, the, the um, surface of the planet, turning farms, in, or excuse me, forests into farms, for example, or into cities. We're uh, moving species around the planet, so facilitating invasions by uh, exotic and invasive species. And we're altering nutrient cycles, like the cycles I showed on the, um, uh, earlier in my talk. For example, by pumping CO2 into the atmosphere. So I'll give you an example of uh, at least one of these. So let's start with land use change and how it might alter uh, microbial diversity. So here's an example of some land use change. So this is in, uh, in Brazil. And the tropics have been particularly vulnerable to the uh, effects of land use change in terms of the plant and animal diversity. It's had a big impact on diversity in the tropics, and it's projected to have an even greater impact if um, land continues to be converted from you know, natural ecosystems into farms and cities. That's especially true of tropical forests, uh, like the Amazon rainforest here. And Brazil, for, for many years, had the absolute highest rate of land use change, the highest rate of, of turning forests into farms. And the reason they had such a high rate is because this was really fueling the growth of their economy, especially the agricultural sector. And most of this 
conversion of, far, of forests into farms was happening so they could raise cattle, or beef cattle in the middle of the Amazon rainforest, which seems kind of ridiculous, but yet they've been able to make a huge profit doing this. And they're now the number one beef exporter in the world because they've converted their rainforest into cattle pasture. And a, a number of groups for many years have been studying the effects of these, this large-scale conversion on plant and animal diversity and on ecosystem functions more broadly. But there's really virtually nothing known about what this sort of conversion was doing to microbial diversity until the last couple of years. And, so, and most of that has come out of this big project that I'm part of in Brazil called the Amazon Rainforest Microbial Observatory. When we started this project in 2009, there were only two published papers about the bacteria that live in the soil of the Amazon. Two. Can you imagine? I mean, this is, one of the, this is the area that's known as being one of the most diverse plant communities in the world. And there were only two papers about the, things that, the, the bacteria that live in the soil in this part of the world. And fortunately, those two papers told two very different stories. One said that the community was very diverse and it was, uh, uh, it could respond to environmental change. The other said just the opposite. So it was as if we knew nothing, even though we had two papers. So when we established this project, our main goal was to try to understand how the conversion of forests into farms might alter little forms of life that live below ground, and whether they're, if they were affected, if that might change the way these microbes function in, uh, uh, in these ecosystems. So the area that we're working in is right at the sort of major front of deforestation. This arc of deforestation is moving up into the forest. So that's the red and yellow areas on this map. And in particular, the area where we're working in has a long history of conversion of forests into farms. So there's a whole mosaic of different land use types uh, in this area. There's a primary forest that hasn't been logged yet, or hopefully never, we'll see. There's a, a new pasture that's been established in the last few years. There's established pasture that's been around for decades, old pasture that's starting to de decline and then secondary forests that have uh, invaded these old pastures. Okay, so we've been able to study this whole chrono sequence of change in this part of the Amazon. So we've done that now for several years. We've focused on a number of different microbial groups. I want to tell you just one story from this project. And that's about orga organisms that I introduced you to just a little while ago in my talk. And that's these organisms, these methane consumers. So as you re recall, I mentioned that in this big methane cycle, the microbes are involved in the production of methane and the consumption of methane. And methane dynamics are really interesting for us to think about in the Amazon because we have evidence that converting the forest into farms is having a big impact on, on methane in this particular part of the world. So here's some data from the site that we work on in Brazil. Um, this is a measures of methane flux. What that means is the net movement of methane from soil into the atmosphere and back. If the numbers are negative, down here, that means that the soil is a net consumer of methane. It's sucking methane out of the atmosphere. If the numbers are positive, it means that it's a net contributor of methane. It's blowing methane off into the atmosphere. And you can see from these data, these different colors are different times of year. These are four different pastures. That turning a forest into a pasture really changes uh, the nature of the movement of methane. So from a situation where forest soils are sucking methane up to a situation where pasture soils are blowing off into the atmosphere. And this could have a huge impact on, on global climate, given the scale at which this forest is being converted into pastures. And it's been a real mystery to the ecologists who've studied uh, methane flux in Brazil why this is happening. And one suggestion was that maybe it had to do with microbes being altered by this conversion of forests into farms. So that was one of the questions we asked as part of our project. Is there any evidence that this conversion alters microbes that eat methane and that might underlie this effect that we're seeing? And then to cut to the chase, yes, <laughs> we, we found evidence for that. Now walk, walk through that. There's three examples of that on this slide. Here in the, on the upper left here is a, uh, some data that shows that, that the, uh, the conversion of forest into farms into pasture result in a decline in the number of different types of microbes that eat methane in the soil. So this is the y-axis is the number of different types and you see a significant decline from forest to pasture. And in other parts of the world, in rice paddies for example, diversity seem of these sorts of microbes seems to be tied to the rate at which methane is consumed and the variation in that rate. 
So this suggests it might be going on in the soils we're studying in the Amazon. One of the things we also did was to ask how many of these creatures live in the soils that we're studying. And we can't grow them in the lab yet, can't keep them in captivity. So what we did instead was to count genes, genes that are specific for this type of organism. And that data is shown here on the right. And what we saw is that, again, the greens forest, browns pasture, there's a big decline in the number of these methane-consuming organisms when you convert a forest into a pasture. And finally, we asked, well, what sort of methane consumers are there in these soils? And do they differ from a forest and a pasture? And here, what we saw that in the forest, we find both of the major groups of methane consumers that are called type 1 methanotrophs and type 2 methanotrophs. So, you know, microbiologists are not particularly creative. Just, it's probably obvious here, right? <laughs> I'd like to think we come up with better names than that, but they're called type 1 and type 2. So you can call them light blue and dark blue. Huh? And what we found is that when you convert forests into pasture, these type 1s go extinct. They disappear. We've never been able to find them uh, in the pastures. And these two types of methane consumers are evolutionarily distinct. They have very different physiologies. We're not really sure how they differ ecologically. But there's a concern that, that this might underlie the change in the methane flux that we're seeing. And there's a number of groups in Brazil now that are trying to culture these organisms to see if they can even more directly link the shifts that they're seeing at the ecosystem level with the changes that we're seeing in the diversity of these types of microbes. And one of the things that's most interesting and, and a little disturbing, I think, is that when we look at the secondary forests at these sites, so these are forests that have encroached on the pasture. You know, they've grown in as the pastures have been ab abandoned. And they start to look like forests again. So it looks like they've recovered in a sense. When we look at their soils, they look much more like pastures than they do forests in terms of these sorts of organisms. They seldom have these type 1 phanotrophs. Their the abundances are low. The diversity is low as well. So it looks like it may take a while, if ever, for this, this, this sort of, the diversity of these sorts of microbes to recover from this change of the forest and the farm. Given the time, I think I'll just, we'll use this as one example. I'll zip through the next, talk about the implications of this. So there's a number of, this is one example of many, and there are a number of other examples that have been published that have showed that in different ways that humans are altering the planet, there's evidence that, that, that those sorts of changes can alter the diversity and the functioning of microbes. There's this growing idea that, you know, that perhaps microbes are much more vulnerable to human activities than we once thought. And that's led to a suggestion that five years ago was laughable. In fact, I had, was laughed at when I, when I mentioned this, right? Which is this idea that maybe we should think about microbes more when we think about conservation. Perhaps we need to think about conserving microbes, not just plants, plant and animal species. Given how, how important they are in terms of the functioning of the planet, um, given this e new evidence that they seem to be altered in their diversity by certain kinds of human activities, that perhaps we need to think about conservation. And this is a dialogue that's really just starting to, to, to happen, as you can see from these examples of these articles. So I want to end by talking a little bit about a third aspect of microbial life that emerged from this new perspective and these new tools. And that's this idea that microbes are you know, much more widespread than we once thought. So the new tools that I described are starting to be trained on many different sorts of environments, often a lot of exotic environments. And wherever we look, we tend to find microbes, find them kilometers up in the air, kilometers deep under the surface of the earth, find them in boiling hot springs and acid pools, all kinds of exotic places. But it, you don't have to really go to exotic places like the Amazon or even California, for that matter, to find <laughs> you know, examples of where humans are interacting really intimately with their microbes. I mean, it's happening in all kinds of environments that we often take for granted, like this one that we're in right now. So right now in this room, we're sitting at the bottom of an ocean of microbes in the air. Right? Probably don't want to think about this, but <laughs> most people don't. But it's true, right? They're moving in with the ventilation system. They came in with us on our clothes and our bodies, you know, being transferred from one to the other. We're in this big sea of microbes, waves crashing around from one side to the other. Right? And we know much less about the microbes that live in these sorts of environments than we do in the Amazon, even. And certainly more than we do in other soil and, and, and other soils and other sites like the ocean. 
So it, you can think about a built environment like this room or this building like an ecosystem. Right? So we could think of this building not as this sort of linear architectural model, but like this example I borrowed from my colleague Charlie Brown in architecture, where each of these different rooms are depicted as a kind of island that's connected through dispersal of microbes, through the ventilation system, movement of humans from room to room. Really, this is an archipelago of different environments that microbes are moving among. And we know virtually nothing about this. But you can learn as much as we know about this if you come in a few weeks and see Jessica Green talk. <laughs> so she's going to talk about this emerging science of indoor ecology that's really being pioneered in large part by work here at the University of Oregon. So this is kind of an advertisement for her, for her talk. And so this is a great example, a room like this, of an environment where we have the opportunity to, to interact really directly and intimately with the, this tiny microbial world. But it's probably not the best example. You could probably think of an environment where we interact even more directly and even more intimately with microbes. That would be what? Yeah. The human body, right? I mean, each of us, as Rue had alluded to, it's kind of a walking rainforest, right? It's an example. Uh, Electromicrograph, skin with microbes and human skin, a hair follicle here. I mean, we're covered with microbes covered inside and outside. Right? Example of what's known about different communities from different sites in the human body. So this is a, one of my favorite, most fascinating environments to think about when I think about how humans interact with microbes. And this is really a, a really ex, a emerging field within microbiology, trying to understand what lives in us and on us. And again, we know li much less about these microbes, believe it or not, than we do things that live in soil. But you can learn a lot more about them you come in a few weeks and see Karen's talk, <laughs> right? So she's going to talk in, about our you know, interactions we have with the microbes that live in us. And hopefully, I'm assuming, she's going to talk about her work in developing this little guy, the zebrafish, as a model to, uh, to allow us to understand in more detail how we interact with the microbes that are in us and on us. All right, so those, those are my two advertisements. So let me just sort of sum up. What I hope I've done is to give you some examples of how our perspective on the microbial world is really changing as scientists. The one where we think of microbes more as allies and enemies, where we are starting to see that they're actually much more vulnerable than we had ever thought to, to human-induced environmental change. Um, and, and in a way, they're much more like the forms of life that we're much more familiar with, plants and animals, than we might have thought before. Right? That's really the take-home message you know, I'd like you to, to leave this talk with. Right? Or, to paraphrase the fellow we started with in this talk, right? a creature is a creature no matter how small. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Yes, sir. If the 7 billion Homo sapiens now on planet Earth, have we become more like microbes or are we still finding it? <laughs> oh, in terms of uh, as a species, as a species. Well, as Rue mentioned, I mean, we certainly, in, in one regard, in terms of the number of cells we have, we certainly are more microbial than we are human in that sense. But, and I, I mean, that's a, that's an interesting question. One of the things that I've thought about when I've thought about the the the, the human microbiome, you know, the microbes that live in us and on us, is that it sort of pushes the limits of what you think of as an individual, right? You and, I, you and I may not share a direct ancestry, you know, family members, but we very well could share the microbes that we have on us. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, it, I think it, it pushes in an interesting way the way we think about ourselves as humans. Other questions? Yes? Any guesses on what the next tree is going to look like and any guesses why some will let you culture and some won't? Oh, those are great questions. Did everybody hear those? So the first question was, what I think this next iteration in this development of, of from Ptolemaic to Copernican biology might look like. And then the second question was, um, why, why, why do I think that it's so difficult for us to keep most microbes in captivity right, to, to culture? So, I mean, the tree that I showed you is a little out of date in that it, it, th there's actually kind of a root, right? The, the, right now, the, the latest information about, that I know of about the, the, the way the tree of life is, is uh, depicted or constructed is we really don't understand very well the relationship of those three big branches of life. 
So that's one of the next big mysteries, I think, that we're going to solve. There was this idea for a while that the archaea were actually a little more closely related to the group that we're in, the eukarya, than they were to the bacteria. But that seems very confusing right now. So the more, the more we learn about them, the more we see examples where they're more like bacteria, more like eukarya. So the, the structure, the relationship of those three big branches, that's a big change that's going to happen, I think. It could be resolved soon. And we're still trying to understand whether a tree is even the best way to think about this. Because there's the potential for genes to move around among organisms on this big tree of life in, in ways that we didn't, we didn't really realize in the, path, in the past. So it may be that we need to make a kind of network or a, or a web to depict diversity of life rather than a tree. So another change that might happen in the near future. And in terms of culturing, um, wow, I mean, it's, there's all kinds of reasons why we might not be able to culture things. The, the numbers I showed you were a little old. And we've been, we, certain groups have gotten better at culturing microbes in some environments. And the common thread that I know of that has increased our ability to culture has been time, so being patient, and working at really, really low concentrations of nutrients, of, of food. That most of the world is not um, like the inside of our body. So we have to, to give the microbes concentrations of food that are really low, that are closer to what they see in, in nature. And then we just have to be really, really patient. And one of the most abundant organisms on Earth, this um, Pelagiobacter microbe that lives in the oceans, Steve Giovannoni up at Oregon State has really been pioneered how to culture something that's really resistant to culture by being very patient and replicating its environment as, as best as possible in the lab. So that's probably the most common way to do it. Yeah. Sorry, I don't think I quite follow your question. I'm trying to, um, what would be the best way to follow, to understand our current understanding of the origins of life? Oh, boy, I've, I, I have no idea. That's not really my field. <laughs> I mean, it's very related, right? I mean, to, to understanding how to resolve these three big branches of the tree of life. But I don't, I don't, it's not an area that I really study, so it would be a, what you should do, I think, is suggest to grad students that that should be the theme for next year's seminar series. <laughs> Bring some folks in to talk about those sorts of big questions. Yeah? Absolutely. We know that for a fact. That there's some really, oh, I'm sorry, the question was, is it possible that that some microbes actually require other microbes to reproduce, to survive. And I assume that maybe that your question is that might underlie our, our, our lack of, of a, well, our, the, the difficulty we find in trying to culture them. And you're absolutely right. It's very insightful. There certainly are examples of microbes where we can co-culture culture them with other things, but we have great difficulty trying to get them to live apart. You know, that's, a, that's an, uh, a, a fairly old, old idea. People had to suggest that when they first realized how difficult it is to culture most microbes. You know, people thought, well, maybe the important microbes are the ones we can grow, right? The ones that we can't grow, they're, you know, they're not very resilient. They're not, you know, and in that sense, maybe they're not so important. And we realized that that's a, that's a very human-centered perspective. Right? <laughs> so there really doesn't seem to be any relationship between those we can grow and you know, either their abundance or uh, uh, their environmental tolerances. Just we haven't figured out the, the, the combination of, of factors that are really required to, to get them to reproduce in the lab. And it may be that we're giving them too much food. It may be that we're not providing them with the partners they need to, to reproduce. But it's not necessarily because they're fragile. Yeah. Well, technically, you would only, I mean, theoretically, you only need one cell. But in practice, it, that, that's not true. And so what many people have done if you can't culture them is that um, is you can often enrich microbes, which means you can, you can bring their environments into the lab. You can manipulate them in, way, in those environments in ways where it's still like, more like the environment they have in the natural world, but it's not a, you know, a, a, um, 
uh, a highly artificial lab environment and still increase their numbers. So some organisms that have been really hard to grow, people have enriched for them. So it's still not a pure culture, but there's so many of them you can start to do things like genomics, you know, to actually look at their whole genome. Um, in most cases with PCR, you don't need very many cells. And, and so the number of cells that you find in the environment are often enough to detect um, the presence of certain microbes. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, humans and other organisms seem to be assemblages or, or um, you know, conglomerations or something. Is there a common term that describes this uh, symbiotic, a symbiotic, mutualistic sort of organism that uh, people will start to be using in common uh, parlance now to describe reality? What a cool question. <laughs> no, Karen, what do you think? Is there a new word for the federation of species that we are? <laughs> I mean, the words that we use now are often words that sort of come from this idea that the microbes that are in us and on us, we can think of as sort of an organ, right, or a, a genome, a second genome. So we talk about the microbiome, or we talk about you know, human-associated microbes. But that kind of still assumes that, you know, we're the boss and the microbes are sort of serving us in a way. So this idea that we're, you know, as you said, a kind of an agglomeration, I'm not sure what the right word is. It's a just one. We'll see if we can get it to be a meme. All right, anyone else? Yes. What's that? I, another great question, one you should probably bring to Karen a question, but, but I'll take a stab at it. I mean, that one thing I've learned as a, as a professor is, is that the reason not to answer a question if you don't, is because you don't know the answer. But I'm going to try it. <laughs> I think I know the answer. Just kidding. So, so the question was, uh, is there a particular time in the development of a human where microbes are introduced to the human body? And so it, the conventional view is that we're essentially sterile when we're born. And so, you know, it's, we're like a new island emerging from the ocean, right? And then we have to be colonized by microbes you know, on the, our surfaces and inside us as well. And so I mean, that's sort of been the traditional view. And there's this whole succession of microbes uh, that happens, like the succession of plants on an, an island that's emerged from the ocean. And so um, that's a traditional view. I know it's been challenged. It's an idea that there is some colonization that happens uh, in utero. Is that accurate, Karen? Yeah? I, For I some mammals, I've yeah? I've heard of colonization. Yeah. The first colonization happens at birth. At birth, yeah. yeah and so the, from the, so the idea is that, that you know, through the birth canal, it, babies pick up their first sort of inoculum of microbes. And there's been some interesting studies, and Karen can correct me if I'm wrong here, but interesting studies that have looked at differences if babies are born vaginally versus cesarean, because you are exposed to different microbes, uh, you know, as essentially sterile beings when you enter the world, if you come, you know, through out surgically or traditionally. And there's been suggestions that the microbes develop differently in the human body if you're if you birthed in those two different ways. Is that fair? Yeah? Okay. Good. So an answer that I knew. <laughs> yes, sir. So what does the concept of species mean in the microbe world since they don't have sex, but they swap genes in different ways? Yeah, that's another great question. So, um, <laughs> well, <laughs> there are many different definitions. Of, oh, but the question was, what does species mean anyway for microbes if they kind of don't have traditional sex, but they can still swap genes around? And so, uh, you know, my, microbes is such a huge group. I and mean, there are individuals that we consider, there are individual types we consider microbes that really do have sex in the traditional sense. Right? And there are ones that are almost asexual. They don't seem to exchange genes very frequently with other creatures. The interesting mix in the middle, though, is what your question comes from. Things that exchanging genes may be infrequently, but across, you know, with, with, with partners that are very different. Right? And um, you know, that does challenge the traditional views of what species are. Um, one, one view is that even with this gene transfer across really different branches of the tree of life, for those genes to be maintained, they have to be incorporated into the genome, and that there's, there's barriers of relatedness to that. It's still much easier to incorporate a gene, in most cases, from something else if you're um, more closely related to it. So in that sense, that kind of lateral gene transfer kind of reinforces the biological species concept, right? You still have, it's a kind of biological species concept. But there's great debate about this. There's others who argue that, that, that those barriers are not very high, relatedness barriers, and that you can get a weird kind of parasexuality um, among microbes. And so um, my thinking about this was really 
changed when I first started as assistant professor at, at Stanford. So I was in the hallway complaining in front of Paul Ehrlich, very famous ecologist, mm -hmm. that I can't do real ecology because I don't have species. My organisms don't have species. And so he came stomping into my office later that day and slapped this paper on my desk that he wrote the year I was born. It basically, was, it was entitled something like, Species Who Needs Them, right? And, and his view was that, you know, as long as we have some units that we're consistent about defining, we can ask questions about the ecology of organisms. Now, it may be difficult to, to make comparisons across organisms that have really different units, but certainly within um, particular groups, like particular groups of microbes, as long as we start with a consistent definition of what we mean by species, then we can look for patterns. And his argument was that even for plants and animals, the the biological species concept doesn't work very well. A lot of exceptions. All right, question over there. Are there happy microbes and sad microbes, like the ones that are growing where GMO crops are versus where organically grown crops are? And I'm just kind of wondering about that. Well, despite all these new tools we have, I haven't figured out how to discern the mood yet among the <laughs> microbes. So there are certainly, there can be different microbes present under, you know, di in different cropping systems. One of the papers I published years ago showed that there were different microbes in apple orchards in Washington that were managed organically versus conventionally. And they, had, they did were different in terms of their function as well, in terms of the rate at which nitrogen was cycled. Now, whether they were happy or not, I don't know. But then, are we happy? Right? I'm getting too philosophical. But were the apples happier? <laughs> Well, the, 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 the leaf nitrogen was higher. So how's that? That's as close as I could get to happiness. Yeah. So I have a question about the type 1 and type 2 uh -huh. nanotropes, I guess. Yeah. Um, what, what's up with, why do you think that's happened? And can you take a big swath of native soil and bring it over to the secondary forest, and will they regrow there? Or is there something fundamental that was lost in the soil and you can't recolonize it? Try, try that yeah, that's a great question. We have no idea at this point. So with this particular group, so we've looked at other groups of microbes, and it seems like um, if you look broadly across all the bacteria, you see big changes in diversity and composition of the communities. And there it seems like it's being driven by soil carbon. That the, When you turn forest into a farm, at least in this part of Brazil, what happens is that you pump a lot of carbon into the soil. And that seems to shift the community in certain ways that makes sense to us. But with the methanotrophs, we're really not certain if that's involved or not. So it's, it's a mystery right now. So there's a number of groups that are really focused on trying to figure this out because it's so important to understanding how the, um, you know, the impacts on the global scale of this, all this deforestation. Wish I had answered that question. Someone? Oh, thank you. Yes. So what was the beginning of your question? Which, mycoplasmas? I, I know nothing about my, well, virtually nothing about mycoplasmas. Karen, anything? No? Should they come in, in next month to learn about mycoplasmas? Now, for that, you'll have to consult the internet, I think. We've exhausted our, our wisdom here. That's a great question. Anything else? Rue, one more? Somebody who hasn't had a chance to ask a question, is there anybody? All right, then two more, these two gentlemen here. Um, is there an equivalent of a rainforest uh, microbial uh, observatory project, or are they measuring diminishing or losses in uh, human activities like this or something like that uh, in, in, in a temperate rainforest? There is. There's a whole series of these microbial observatories. There's nothing around here. The closest, I think, is work that's being done in Andrews uh, uh, Experimental Forest, um, up, in, yeah, up near uh, uh, Corvallis, kind of. It's a different sort of setup there. They're not focused on the same kind of land use changes that we are. We've been looking for a comparative, comparative set. There's some work in the upper Midwest that's closer to what we're doing, where they're looking at the effects of deforestation. The difference is that it's not common, in, in, at least in the U.S., to log, burn down a forest, and then turn into a cattle pasture. We have a lot of cattle pasture, right? Yeah. Sort of all of the Midwest, basically. And so the, the changes in land use are a little bit different. So it's not a direct, a perfect direct comparison for us. But there are observatories like this all over the world that were established by the National Science Foundation to try to understand 
know, what microbes live where and, and why. Yep? Is there any understanding of uh, what nanoparticles may, what effect they might have on this environment? Not that I know of. This is an, I had an interesting over beer conversation with a chemist here about this very topic. So, you know, we've, we talked about the built environment there when I introduced Jessica Green's talk, the idea of this whole building is of an environment. There's a, a, this chemist and I hatched the idea of the worn environment, right? So, we've, our clothing is kind of an environment for microbes. And one of the ideas that Nike's been working on is to embed, right, different kinds of nanoparticles into clothing to reduce microbial colonization of clothes. We really don't know what that does to microbes. It's one area that needs to be studied. And in general, the effects of nanoparticles, nanotechnology on environments not really well understood that, that I know of. So that's a long-winded answer of saying, no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps that should be the last question. My answers are getting longer and longer and have less content each time. But thank you very much. For